I'm Caroline Hyde. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, while well, President Trump meets with CEOs on his infrastructure plans, but Silicon Valley execs are absent. How tech could be playing a bigger role. Plus, Lyft adds a new lineup of backers and more than a billion dollars to its valuation. Could an IPO come sooner than we thought? And Toshiba warns about its future on the heels of a highly anticipated earnings announcement. We'll discuss whether the company can recover. First to our lead, President Donald Trump's message to corporate America, job creation is at the top of the agenda. He made those comments at a strategic and policy meeting with 20 CEOs today. Tuesday's meeting was focused on Trump's $1 trillion infrastructure program, as well as tax policy going forward. In attendance, the likes of GM, PepsiCo and Walmart CEOs, but save IBM's Ginny Rometty, noticeably absent from the meeting were chief, of chief executive officers from a high growth sector being tech. Back in December of last year, Trump had a meeting with the likes of Amazon's Jeff Bezos, Oracle's Safra Katz and Apple's Tim Cook, just to name but a few. So how is Silicon Valley's relationship with the president evolving? Here with us is Roger McNamee, co-founder of Elevation Partners and Silver Lake Partners, and I'm very pleased to say my guest host for the hour. Enjoy to have you here with us, Roger. And first of all, your view on the new administration and the priorities well, thereof. You, know, you think infrastructure is number one? You think tax is number no, one? No, I, I, I think just staying alive is the only thing that they seem to care about. To me, the infrastructure thing is a headline. It's not actually a plan. And relative to Silicon Valley, so far the actions they've taken are extremely destructive. The head of the FCC has made it incredibly clear that he is going to be hostile to the needs of consumers and by extension, entrepreneurs who are trying to create new businesses and technology. So I am not optimistic. I think that the, uh, the opportunities for any president of the United States to build great value through technology are there. But the industry needs some help right now. It got, uh, it got itself a little bit out of joint over the last few years. And there are, there are great opportunities, but I think also challenges. I think the industry has been way too focused on getting rid of jobs. And you know we're in this weird situation where technically the economy is at full employment, but tens of millions of people feel that they've been left behind in this cycle. And I think they really have. And to me, I'd like to see Silicon Valley have a new challenge like Moore's Law, but the challenge would be create industries that employ people in good jobs. I think if you had that kind of a challenge, Silicon Valley would over time rise to it and a lot of great things would come out of it. I mean, Silicon Valley itself created a lot of great jobs. There's no reason we can't be doing this broadly. So, because it's fascinating that the administration, of course, have targeted immigration as the key threat, whereas actually automation is what many people feel has been eroding the jobs that are trying to be resuscitated in manufacturing. But should we not be looking for a paradigm shift in the way that we all work? Are you not more of that viewpoint, or do you feel that actually we need to somehow have everyone well, fully employed, but what sort of jobs are we going to be creating? Well, to me, that's the challenge. You know, I look at this in a very simple way, which is the economy requires consumers. Consumers spend two-thirds of the money. And so it doesn't work if large percentage of the population don't participate in any economic recovery. Yeah. So the goal has to be to make jobs more remunerative, more fulfilling, so that people have more money to spend. Henry Ford's great innovation wasn't really the production line. It was the notion that he was going to pay his employees well enough that they could afford to buy Ford cars. But then eventually we saw a turn and a down cycle well, course, after that. They couldn't afford to buy the cars anymore, and we saw an unbelievable unveiling of infrastructure. But I, I would argue that that one of the challenges we face in the country is that we've been doing the same things now for nearly 40 years, which is, say, cutting taxes and getting rid of regulations. And there were huge benefits to doing those at the early part of that cycle. But I think the benefits have been accruing to us fewer and fewer people in recent years. And it's time to try something different. I Universal look, basic, basic income? Would it be I don't better know. to have a net rather than... I, I, I don't know. I'm not competent to make that call. What I am competent to say, though, is that it, it doesn't have to be the way it is right now, okay. that uh, we have essentially 
you saw this week United Airlines with that horrible situation. The last few weeks we've had these uh, increasing pieces of news about Wells Fargo. Those are a direct result of deregulation going so far that companies literally have no regard to their employee for their customers, excuse me, and no fear of repercussions if they treat them badly. And in my mind, we have to, you know, we have to make some changes because those things aren't working and they're not healthy for the economy to have people treat their customers that badly. You're fascinating with the fact that you say, okay, incentivize Silicon Valley or entrepreneurs, wherever they might be based across the world, not just the US, to create long-term gainful employment. Well, that was well, the model until 1980, right? Until 1980, companies viewed themselves as not just having customers and shareholders, they also had the communities in which they operate. But efficiency, doesn't that eventually erode that and, and, and how therefore, well, why what sort is of it, roles, what sort of jobs? Why is efficiency what? the only thing we should focus on, right? I should look at be? this and I think, I mean, I think it's taken us to where we are today. And I'm going, too much of a good thing. Okay. Some efficiency is really, really healthy. To so slow it down? Slow no, I'm not saying down? slow it down, just reprioritize. Okay. Sit there and say, right now we're going to have a period of time where we reward people for creating jobs, where we reward people for industries in but which... Trump is. He oh, keeps baloney. on uh, trying oh, to get people no, no, in no. to announce he's, more he's jobs. He's signing up to take credit for jobs created by other people. The economy is basically at full employment. There's nothing he can do on jobs. Yeah. Right. What we have to do is qualitatively change the kind of jobs that are out there. And the sharing economy is not the answer. People have got to have jobs where they can take care of things like health care. I mean, to me, I don't know about universal employment, but I do, or universal income. What I do know, though, is that universal health care would actually take away one of the biggest fears that people have and make it possible for the economy to do better than it's doing now. But I just think we, right now we've hollowed out the economy. We've, create, we've eliminated the middle class in ways that are just not healthy for, for public companies, not healthy for private companies. If you want to be a business person, I think you just need to ask the question, is there a better way than the way we're doing it right now? And I think the answer is likely to be yes. Roger, you've got people thinking already. It's great to have you with me. I'm so glad you're here for the hour. Roger McNamee, co-founder of Elevation Partners and Silver Lake Partners, going to be my guest host for the day. Meanwhile, Toshiba has released its earnings after delaying the announcement, not once, but twice, and gave a warning about its ability to even stay in business in the wake of a bankruptcy out of the, its nuclear Westinghouse unit. Now, the Japanese conglomerate posted a $5.2 billion loss in its last quarter, but its auditor still hasn't signed off those figures. And jump in with me to my Bloomberg, and you can see the closer impact of Toshiba's troubles. Check this out, G hashtag BTV6001 is what you can type into your terminal. You can see the company's market cap tumbling 50% since December, more than 10 billion wiped off of its market cap. We'll be covering Toshiba and the sale of its chip business much more later this hour. Now coming up, Qualcomm fires back at Apple with a countersuit in response to Apple's patent case against the chip maker. We'll discuss, discuss where things stand between the tech giants. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Now, shares of Dialogue Semiconductor plunged more than 15% in the session, the most in 16 years. The firm Backhaus Lampe downgraded the UK-based but German-listed chipmaker to a sell, saying there is strong evidence that Apple plans to partially replace the power management chip in its iPhones, currently supplied by Dialogue. Apple accounts for three-fourths of Dialogue's revenue. Oh, a slight deja vu from Imagination Technology this time last week. Now, st sticking with chipmakers, Qualcomm fighting back after getting hit with a massive lawsuit from Apple and the chipmaker denied any wrongdoing and issued counterclaims that Apple had made quote false statements to regulators ignored its own contracts and interfered with Qualcomm's business for more let's turn to Ian King who covers Qualcomm for Bloomberg technology still with us our guest host for the hour Roger McNamee I mean quite quite a tense and stormy piece of, of argument going on between Apple and Qualcomm. A global attack is what Qualcomm calls it. Remind us what's at stake here. Well, what's fundamentally at stake is a lot of money. These two companies arguably led the smartphone revolution, made the most money in their relative industries out of that. Now, as things are slowing down, as we're turning from absolute growth towards margins, who's the most profitable? Qualcomm has been the one supplier that Apple just hasn't been able to quit. Um, it licenses its te technology very expensive way. So whether 
Apple uses its chips or not, like the rest of still the smartphone pays. industry, still paying. Apple is clearly trying to do something about that, and according to Qualcomm, is lying to try and do something about that. Roger, how do you interpret these sorts of battles in the courtroom, help hindering technology? I think he had it exactly right. It's the stakes, particularly in smartphones, are so huge. I mean, let's face it, this is the largest product in the history of technology. And so you have this situation where you could build, as in the case of Dialog, an entire company off of essentially one component for one customer. And you know that kind of scale we haven't seen in a long, long time. The battle between these two is going to come down to politics, I think, as much as it is to the law, because the, there's a lot of murkiness around intellectual property law, and they're both very well funded. They both have enormous economic self-interest here. I think that the law probably favors uh, Qualcomm in this, and I suspect that the, uh, the common sense favors Apple. And mm -hmm. Right, and so they're both going to have leverage points around this, and we'll probably, you know, we may make some new interpretations of the law around this, right? Because this will be a case that people will look at, you know, as a precedent, a precedent for for other things. And much as with Rambus seven, eight years ago, where you know there was a huge battle over essentially an analogous kind of situation, Rambus in the end lost. And they didn't lose because they didn't have valid contracts, and they didn't lose because the intellectual property law favored their position. They lost because politically the other people had more power. And in this situation, I suspect Apple will have more political power than Qualcomm. And that's right. And a big part of what Qualcomm argued today was like, look how valuable we've been to the development of this industry. Look how much money we've put into it. Look how much we've created. Well. We're not just some patent troll trying to cash in on some little, you know, sliver of an invention. We give you everything that we invent and patent up, up until today, we give you. But it's not just the US that hasn't liked this and not just Apple that hasn't yeah. liked this. This has been international. South Korea has fined them. Exactly. And we've seen other players yeah. coming after Apple. Well, and, and if you are, and, and if you take what Qualcomm said at face value, that's been Apple working behind the scenes, going to China, going to Japan, going to Korea, whispering in the ear of regulators and saying, these are the bad guys here. You need to do something about this. Very quickly, trial. Do we know when that will begin? Uh, not at the moment, no. I mean, I asked the general counsel last night, how long is this going to take? said realistically at least a couple of years and it won't be settled there it'll be appealed and the fight's going to go on the amount of money is just too huge to yeah. to take whatever the answer is at face value may the decade-long battle commence gentlemen indeed. thank you very much indeed ian king is ever brilliant reporting bloomberg technology reporter on all things chips and our guest host roger mcnamee co-founder of elevation partners and silver lake is staying with us now, coming up, Lyft's new lineup of investors has some raising eyebrows about the timing of an IPO. We'll focus on the new funding and competition with Uber. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Now, the ride-hailing company Lyft is worth $7.5 billion after a new $600 million round of financing. That's up from $5.5 billion valuation from December 2015. Perhaps more importantly is who is investing in Lyft. New backers include the private equity firm KKR as well as a handful of asset management firms and a Canadian pension fund. Hence, Lyft is tapping a set of investors who will basically frequently back public companies or provide funding just ahead of an IPO. And while the company has kept quiet about its exit plans, investors have long speculated that Lyft would be smart to go public before its much larger competitor, Uber. Still with us to discuss the state of ride-hailing industry is our guest host for the hour, Silver Lake and Elevation partner, co-founder, Roger McNamee. Roger, I know you're a man who loves all things around the disruption of transportation and the like. I hear you're a man who has every single app that's out there going for transportation. But do you think this is a wise move by Lyft to start oh, getting definitely. these bigger players in and start looking at the public well, market? I, I make it in a much simpler fashion. I think they need more capital. Mm. Now, Full disclosure, I am through a fund I'm invested in, indirectly an investor in Lyft. 
My observation about the category is I think the category has deep economic issues that for all intents and purposes, it got commoditized before it got anywhere near break even. And they don't own either the cars or have any control over the drivers. And what has been shown, at least in New York City, is that it's possible to segment and slice pieces of the market off and compete with Lyft and Uber by picking very narrow subsets of the marketplace. Because Explain that. So there's a company in New York that just goes up and down the avenues like a jitney, right? So it's very, very cheap if you're just going from 81st Street to Broadway or wherever, you can do that. And uh, it, there's other ones, there's one that just takes four and five star uh, Uber drivers and gives the driver a much better deal than what Uber does. And so there are a bunch of these people playing that game. And so I look at this and I go, the consumer value proposition to this point has felt really, really good. The yeah. driver proposition has not been good. And the unstated piece is how do you replace the cars over time? Because at the current rate, I mean, the assumption is there's a limitless supply of new drivers. And I don't think that's actually true. And to my mind, Lyft has an opportunity now to have a much better relationship with the drivers. Mm -hmm. And I think they would be well advised to find a way that makes the, the whole experience more financially rewarding and then to go to the consumers and say, you should pay more for this because our drivers will do better, this will be a better service long term. Because I think consumers have gotten too good a price to this point, which is why this thing has exploded and why the math has worked so poorly for the drivers. What's so interesting though is we've seen the backlash that Delete Uber ha happened to be fueled, whether or not that was fair on Uber at the time. Well, indisputably fair. Indisputably fair? Really? Why? Because... Well, I, I just think that, that Uber has conducted itself uniformly with a complete disregard, not just for the law, but for social conventions. Yeah. And, you know, I look at this and I go, you know, it's one story after another, and there are literally no data points on the other side. And, you know, all the stories could only be 70% accurate, and it would still be more than enough for people to go, you know what, you know, I'm not going to do that. If and you were a direct investor in Uber now, not even through a fund as you well, mentioned. I've had lift, three shots. You? I've had three shots, and I've passed all three times on this issue, starting very, very early. Because it, they, of the management, do you yes, think? Yes, because of the culture. No. That I thought, I thought there's, I have, I, I personally, look, I have a value system and I, I have a, um, a no a-hole rule. You know, I don't invest in certain kinds of people and against certain kinds of value systems. And I'm prepared to give up great returns to do that. It was obvious to me early that Uber had a brilliant idea and could be enormously successful. But at the same time, I was deeply troubled by what was already clear, even in those very early days, a culture that essentially not just flaunted rules for the sake of flaunting them and uh, didn't treat female employees well and didn't treat drivers well. And I just thought, you know, there are better things for my, me to do with my capital. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Lyft has been better. You can tip drivers, for example. But but it it isn't perfect, and there's a lot of room for them to make it better. And I think that the sharing economy, as it's been broadly described, has had this promise in it that everyone would benefit from this. And I think that hasn't been true for the people driving the cars. And I'd like to see that. I, I think that's a, an attainable goal. Do you think that it's because in the short for Uber, drivers are but a short-term investment, and in the longer term, their business, do you believe, is predicated on automation or, I, or see, and autonomous vehicles? Or maybe, not? maybe, but I look at this and I go, what a cold way of looking at it. The other thing is that's going to cost billions to get to if they're going to do their own. And, and they've got billions, though. Well, but they're spending billions, too, so they're going to need more capital to get there. I look at this and... I remember being here at Bloomberg uh, doing a show four or five years ago, and one of the senior executives of Bloomberg was, of, of uh, Uber was here. And I took him aside afterwards and I said, have you guys ever thought about taking all this capital you're getting and going to the car companies and saying, we're going to do what Amazon and Facebook and Google did. We want a car specifically tailored to our needs, just the way they did in servers. We're going to strip out everything that doesn't look like an Uber. Keyless entry, each driver has a key, but they don't have to own the cars. All the insurance, everything tied to it, all the cars look identical, they all have a same service contract, they are maintained. 
they could have gotten their cars for maybe half of what the replacement cost is in the marketplace today, would have given them a permanent advantage. And you know, with the same money that they've spent to this point, they would own hundreds of thousands, if not millions of cars. And I look back and just think, what an, that was a missed opportunity. And you know, would it have worked out perfectly? I don't know. But it's pretty clear that the path they're on now has a very high risk of failure in it. So do you think that they will be able to tap the market publicly in the next couple of years, Uber and indeed Lyft? I don't know. Um, you know, right now Lyft loses almost as much money in a year as it has revenues. And that's an equation where historically investors have been gun shy. After Snap, we can't be so sure. Mm. But, you know, let's see how these things work out. You know, again, the, the idea behind Lyft and Uber is genius. The execution has left something to be desired. And it's not the fault entirely of the companies. There are just too many people in it. The barriers to entry were too low. And so having all that competition so early has led to this situation where the consumers get a great value and nobody else does. Not the companies offering it, not the drivers. And that's, it's going to be hard to sustain that. And it worries me a lot because it was such a great idea. Such a great idea and one that clearly some investors still want in, but not Well, and, and you know, that's what makes markets so beautiful. I could be totally wrong about this, right? I mean, it may be that they just let a little air out of the balloon and everything's going to be fine. But, but what some if, big changes well, in What if it's not? But I like investing at seven and a half billion in Lyft way better. Yeah, rather than 65 billion or something that Uber is currently at. It's been wonderful, of course. Uh, Roger McNamee sticking with me, co founder of Elevation Partners, and my guest host for this hour. Now, coming up, your phone addiction isn't entirely your fault. We'll talk to one former Google employee who says the engineers in Silicon Valley are the ones creating the obsession. This is Bloomberg. I'm Mark Crumpton. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's begin with a check of first word news. Russian President Vladimir Putin wants the United Nations to investigate the chemical weapons attack in Syria. We have intelligence from various sources that similar provocations are being prepared in other regions of Syria, including southern suburbs of Damascus, where they are planning to plant chemicals and blame the Syrian government for using them. We believe that any displays of this kind deserve to be thoroughly investigated. Russia has rejected allegations that its ally, the Syrian government, was responsible. More than 100 prospective candidates have signed up so far on the first day of registration for Iran's presidential elections. Registration is open until Saturday, and any Iranian national can apply, though the Guardian Council normally does not approve dissidents or women for the formal list. President Hassan Rouhani is eligible to run for another term. The election will be held May 19th. North Korea's parliament convened today as the U.S. and South Korea conduct the largest ever military exercises on the Korean Peninsula since the start of their alliance. The USS Carl Vinson aircraft carrier is also headed to the area. Experts say Pyongyang could be preparing for its sixth nuclear launch. I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. This is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 p.m. Tuesday here in New York, 7.30 Wednesday morning in Sydney. My colleague David Fickling joins us with a look at the markets. David, good morning. Good morning, Mark. And ahead of markets open, uh, futures on Australia's ASX 200 index are pointing up about a quarter of a percent. Uh, those on the Nikkei 200 in Japan down about 0.4 percent. Today, we're going to be looking at uh, the inflation data out of China. We're seeing CPI and P PPI data. Uh, PPI was its highest since 2008 last month, and CPI close to its lowest since 2009. Economists are expecting that's going to pull in a little bit now uh, at 7.5 percent for production producer prices and uh, at 1% for consumer prices. We're also going to be looking at Japan, where Aonco, the country's largest supermarket, reports annual results. Um, Aonco is an interesting uh, stock. It's not had a single buy rating on the stock since 2015, but the share price is up about 30% 30 um, 30 over that period. It's now on a valuation not that much uh, different to Amazon.com. So those are the main things we're going to be looking at today. Uh, I'm David Fickling. Bloomberg Technology continues next.
This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde. Now, many parents are convinced their children are addicted to their phone. Perhaps you're concerned for your own addiction levels. And, well, perhaps you're right to be. Former Google product manager and then design eth eth ethicist the ethicist, let me get that out, Tristan Harris, says engineers of Silicon Valley are creating phones, apps and social networks to get people fixated. Now, it's a phenomenon become called brain hacking. So, what are the long-term consequences? Joining us from New York is that ethicist himself, Tristan Harris, now founder of the non-profit movement Time Well Spent. Also still with us, guest host with our Elevation Partners co-founder and Silver Lake Partners co-founder Roger McNamee. Tristan, this is a fascinating area that you're already focusing in on. I was looking at your, at your biography. You left Google in 2016. Why, as the ethicist of Google, did you leave? Did you feel that they weren't listening to some of your points of view? No, well, I think, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting problem. I mean, all of these technology companies are locked into the attention economy. And no matter what you're building, whether it's a meditation app or uh, Facebook or Netflix or YouTube, no matter what you're making, or Bloomberg, you're still competing for attention. And um, you know, I think that what I what I left to create is a conversation about the costs of advertising and the attention economy, and whether it's creating the kind of world we want to live in, both for democracy with the rise of things like fake news, and in terms of how it affects children uh, with these these increasingly persuasive techniques that get thrown into apps like Snapchat that that go public on networks like this. How are the greater consumer base, who are you targeting at the moment with your not-for-profit movement and are people listening? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, I, we just went on 60 Minutes and there was a great piece with Anderson Cooper and, and I think that uh, people in the industry do agree. I think that it's hard to sort of accept though what's really at, at stake and how to get off the train. I mean, at the end of the day, if you're a product manager working at Facebook, your incentives, your goals, how you are measured is to maximize engagement. You leave the company two years later saying, I increased this metric by 15%. But all of this increasing of usage doesn't add up to uh, necessarily what we actually want our world to look like. It's a world that's increasingly persuasive, that sucks us in, uh, and, and, and leads to us having to show someone the most engaging things, which aren't necessarily the things that are best for us. Tristan, Roger McNamee here. Good to see you, old Good friend. Good to see you again, yeah. So during the election season, actually over the course of the summer, I became increasingly alarmed by my perception that Facebook had basically inadvertently become a tool that was being used to distort democracy first in Brexit and then in the election cycle here. And one of the things that I discovered in talking to the team there was initially a reluctance to accept responsibility, to, to basically try to dismiss this kind of stuff as just, hey, we're running experiments, some of them don't work out. And what I'm curious is, is this something you think can be addressed inside the industry or are we going to need some kind of regulatory thing from the outside in order to get uh, the proper attention brought to it? Well, I, I think you're absolutely right. We need to have much more attention brought to it and the question is where is it going to come from? Is it going to be from regulation or is it going to be because of consumer pressure when people finally realize that these companies are not building their products just to serve us. They have to serve advertisers. And so, uh, you know, I think you're, you're right to be concerned about, about how this was affecting the elections. It's one of my, my deepest concerns as well. I mean, if you think about it this way, Facebook has a team of engineers who are working on the fake news problem that they kind of scrambled after uh, the U.S. elections. But no matter what they do, how will we know that they're doing enough? How will we know what they're doing that's not going to be transparent? Um, and how do we know they're putting sufficient resources, especially if uh, what they're doing conflicts with their own business interests. And I think of this like the attention economy is the city of a billion people, and we're all living inside of it. Actually, our mind lives inside of it. But we don't have any public representation in that city. These three private companies, Apple, Google, and Facebook, uh, basically run the city. And we've sort of been inside of it for a long time, but we need more representation. So what is that new relationship where we have representation in the city? It does seem to me, Tristan, that one of the challenges that we face here is that that the consumer has no way to become aware of what the problem is. I look at the, the issue, the so-called filter bubbles that apply particularly around Google and uh, Facebook, where you basically only see things that they believe you like already. And so you build these walls that are essentially impervious to all outside influences. And against that, they then have created ad tools that allow advertisers to discriminate. And that that business model, it seems to me, has been so successful that the economic argument 
for the status quo must be compelling to those companies. It, it's really hard to admit that you've caused Brexit or contributed to Trump's getting elected if your entire business model depends on your having done the very things that will enable those outcomes. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. I mean, I think we have to, if you look back through history, um, it, you know, there, there are often times in history when we discover that something is morally repugnant, but our whole economy is based on it. So in, in slavery, there used to be slavery, and it took 60 yeah. years. When the British Empire wanted to reduce, uh, get off of slavery, they had to give up 2% of their GDP every year for 60 years. So now our whole tech economy is propped up by advertising. And it's served us really well, and it's, been, it's created a lot of wealth. There's a lot of, a lot of great things that have come from it. But when the costs are too high, when, like you said, if, I have, if I'm Facebook and I have one news feed I can show you that has filter bubbles that just confirms your existing beliefs, and I have another news feed I can show you that doesn't confirm your beliefs, if the one that doesn't confirm your beliefs loses engagement or doesn't hook you, then everyone else is going to swoop in and get the attention. So I have to show you the one that just confirms your beliefs. As Facebook, I'm locked yeah. in to doing what's bad for democracy. Tristan, which stakeholder, therefore, is it best to target? Is it best to target the consumer? Is the shareholder, is an investor such as Roger Sapp here, who was once in Facebook, is it for them to go and hold the executives to account? Is it employees? Who do you target with most efficacy? You know, I, I think this is a thing that we're working out. I mean, I actually love the idea of, of having more shareholder control and shareholder influence when we collectively realize the cost both on democracy and, and children. Um, I think that's a fantastic way of obviously that's moved other kinds of uh, industries in the past. I think the threat of regulation is another one, although it's very hard in the current environment. Um, although there is some optionality in, in California, because uh, there's the California uh, uh, legislatures that you can go to there. But uh, that's, that's the conversation I'm trying to create. Fascinating, and I'm so glad we had it on this show. Thank you very much indeed. Formal Google design ethicist Tristan Harris, wonderful to have you on the show. Roger McNamee, co-founder of Elevation Partners and Silver Lake Partners, wonderful to have you asking such pertinent questions as well. He's sticking with me for the rest of the hour. Now to a story we're watching. A top European regulator will likely order Yahoo to make changes after one of the biggest data breaches in history. Ireland's Data Protection Commissioner said a probe by her office is almost done and shows that Yahoo's European unit is at least in part to blame for the 2014 incident. Under new European Union rules, starting May 2018, companies being probed for serious privacy violations in Europe will face fines of as much as 4% of their global annual sales. Now coming up, Toshiba reports earnings results after delaying the report not once, but twice. We'll dig into the results and the company's warning about its future. This is Bloomberg. Now let's turn back to Toshiba now. After months of dealing with the fallout of the bankruptcy of its nuclear Westinghouse unit, the conglomerate reveals doubts about its very future. So is Toshiba crippled beyond repair or could the sale of its chip business get it right on track? Corey Johnson, Bloomberg editor at large, joins us along with our guest host for the hour, Roger McNamee from Elevation Partners. Corey, talk us through it because you had some wonderful analogies last time you were looking back at the history of this company. Oh, really? Raise the bar on me? Okay. <laughs> well, uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting business. I mean, it, it's, it's this Westinghouse nuclear power business uh, is so interesting, but they've had so many problems, many of them of their own making, accounting problems within the firm, a whistleblower within Westinghouse suggesting the books weren't right. Toshiba not really coming clean on this. And so today we have this development where Toshiba finally says, we're just going to publish our financial results, even though our accountant won't sign off on it. Oh, yeah, and by the way, we might go bankrupt. Just to sledgehammer that in. Roger, looking from afar, we were talking offline just earlier about Japan's history in chips, and, and they used to own the, rule the roost, really. They really did. I, I, I will never forget the late 80s meeting the vice chair of Toshiba, and when it was basically just a chip company, at least in the United States. And they were so dominant at that time. The only American company that showed any viability at all was Intel. We were out of memory, more or less, and we were basically beaten, beaten by Japanese companies companies everywhere and he basically said look you can get rid of your intel you don't need to you don't need to be a semiconductor analyst anymore Magnum, because it's over we have won and we're all tempted to look at google and facebook and apple and all that way today and i think what's going on at T toshiba gives you a sense that you know in technology at least nothing is forever 
Uh, and and it also, the, you know, they made some really dumb bets. I mean, betting on nuclear power was, and, and with this big Westinghouse acquisition, was just a bad business decision. It's not a great business to but be in. But big companies make bad business decisions yeah. frequently. And, you know, Absolutely. That's, that's part of what that's, comes with the territory of, of outgrowing your market. You outgrow your market and you basically look for something else that looks like it will replace it. And inevitably, they're not domain experts in the things they buy, and so something goes wrong. Talking about the two, J Japan a long time ago versus US now, do you think the shareholders, we have a lot of activists and shareholders who hold publicly traded US companies to account. There ha we have seen a garnering of control. Think of the purchase of WhatsApp or indeed Instagram or, or the, the Mark Zuckerberg made and some potentially questioned, particularly Oculus. Do you think the controls are there, the safeguards are there for shareholders to rein in bad behavior? According? Well, clearly not. I mean, we could see bad, there are stocks that go to zero every year. There's always a big fraud out there. There are certainly frauds in the publicly traded markets right now. That's how I've made my trade as a short seller for many years. But I think that it's also important to hear when you look at the, the problems with what Toshiba has done. You know, this nuclear power business is one where the contracts are so long and the, and the construction will take so many years and the financial guarantees they must provide to their customers, utility companies, are so great that when the company has financial stumbles, it doesn't have the wherewithal to recover because they don't have the financial backing they can go and the guarantees they can provide to the companies they're doing the work for. Roger, a thought on on corporate governance, particularly as we've seen the Snap IPO, for example, I, and, I, and how yeah. the people have so much control at the helm of the companies, but sometimes you've got to back an entrepreneur because all the bets that Facebook have made thus far are right. I wouldn't count on corporate governance to bail you out of any problem in the United States. I think, in general, corporate governance in the United States is something that we pay lip service to and which, in reality, is uh, at best dormant. Uh, at worst, it's genuinely harmful. I think you know, activist investors in general, you know, produce bad long-run outcomes that they optimize for the short term. You wonder why there's so many people who are dissatisfied with uh, their lot in this particular economic recovery. It's because activist shareholders or the people who preceded them, you know, the raiders, went in and slashed and burned and closed down the factories, moved everything first. To the, the Oakland Raiders, the yeah. Carl Icons of the world. It's wherever. Yes. But they, they would, you know, first move to the Sun Belt, then they would move to Asia. And, you know, that whole thing was a, I mean, that, that's been with us for a very, very long time. And I would, they keep changing names, right? And you know, first it was Greenmail, then there was Raiders, then there was right. then you know, there's activists. And the investors. tools are different too. There was leverage buyouts at a right. certain time, and that's not the tool of, of favor right now. Yeah. But nonetheless, but but at the end of the day, it all comes down to the same thing, which is somebody's out to make a buck right now. And you know, at the end of the day, there are times when that is the best strategy for the company. But there are also times when that, in fact, may only be the best strategy for a limited number of investors over a very short period of time. And I think lately, 40 years into that practice, more often than not, it isn't working out. And, and to the point, it's, it's, it's legalese. I mean, this going concern phrase is something they put into the release so they can't get sued later, even if their corporate governance is bad. And what we've seen from Toshiba suggests that it is. And strikes terror into many of the investor heart, I'm sure. Corey Johnson, great analysis, absolutely ever. Corey Johnson, our Bloomberg editor at large, and Roger McNamee making a great team. They were desperate to talk guitars, but we managed to keep it on tech. <laughs> now, up next, we we're going to be talking about internet privacy protections. We're going to be talking net neutrality rules, of course. We're focused on the future of the FCC. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Now on the latest tech funding board, a real estate data firm called Real Matters is gearing up to be Canada's first tech IPO in two years. The company issued regulatory filings Tuesday. According to people familiar with the matter, Real Matters is seeking to raise about $94 million for a valuation of $750 million. Shopify was the last Canadian tech company to go public. Shares have nearly tripled since then. Meantime, the European cable giant Altice is planning an IPO of its US business. The company's billionaire founder, Patrick Drahi, is looking to exploit potential stock market gains to fuel further expansion. A preliminary regulatory filing did not offer details on how much stock Altice is selling or a possible valuation for the unit. But Altice USA was formed of two US acquisitions that cost more than $26 billion, including some debt. 
Now, sticking with the United States, a new FCC chairman, Ajit Pai, has made no secret of the fact that he'd like to undo the net neutrality rules of the previous administration, specifically repealing the Title II classification that gives the FCC broad oversight of internet service providers. Now, according to some reports, Pai has already begun sketching out ideas for how he can do that. Still with us is our guest host throughout the hour, Roger McNamee, co-founder of Elevation Partners. And you started off this hour by saying you were worried by the moves the FCC has made in terms of control consumer privacy and and indeed entrepreneurial viewpoints of the future is this yeah. going to hurt well, entrepreneurs even well, more well simply put we live in an era now where if let's think about media whether it's music or movies streaming services are becoming you know much more prevalent yeah. in music it, they dominate yeah. and increasingly they're a huge factor in television programming and movies and when you think about it, those services are very concentrated. They're only a handful of players. And so if you were to take the net neutrality rules and eliminate them now, you'd essentially be locking those people in place. And so the entrepreneurs who create content and entrepreneurs who might want to compete with them would be at a massive, massive disadvantage. So I think the thing about Pi that's so disturbing is that he has an unerring preference for the largest incumbent players over absolutely everyone else. I don't know if you saw the thing they're talking about, no more cell phone usage after the plane lands. I mean, that kind of stuff is just needlessly uh, antagonistic towards consumers. And I, I just, I don't understand the thought process of this whole administration. They just, they operate in this idea that, uh, that business doesn't need customers and it doesn't need customer satisfaction to produce better outcomes. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Are there any business opportunities from some of these unwindings? Because I'm looking at the ISP providers, for example, the internet service providers who were, are now able, theoretically, to sell our data, our, our viewing habits on the internet. Now many say it, therefore say, look, the rise of the VPN is upon us and we're going to start to see the more private internet service providers come to the fore. Are there any winners out of if we do see a tailing back of net neutrality? Because Ajit Pai himself says he still wants to keep fairness in there. Oh, I think just... that's total baloney. I don't think he has any interest in fairness for anything other than the handful of major players. But why? That... Why does he just Well, want to why? Lose? I mean, why did they have a Muslim ban? Why did they just needlessly blow up a bunch of empty buildings in Syria? I mean, you know, there's, I don't understand anything that these people are doing. You know, it's not thoughtful. It's not based on evidence. It's not based on consumer needs. It's not based on any desire to make consumers happy. And so I find it deeply, deeply disturbing. And the, the sale of consumer data without consumers uh, permission without any ability, ability to opt out. It, I mean, in whose interest is that, right? That's, you know. But they weren't being potentially, what the fight back, if I play the, the other side, is the internet service provider said, well, do the same for Google, do the same for Facebook, have them regulated to the same extent as we are with customers' data. And perhaps we are, to, do all to, to sign To be clear, away. I would be absolutely fine with that. I think that would be a much better solution. See. than opening it all up. You know, I, again, we just got off with Tristan Harris. I think, in fact, the use of consumer data by social networks and by Google has produced some really, really unfortunate outcomes. And I think our refusal to accept those as lessons, to learn from them and to do better, is causing great harm to our society. And when you harm the society, you're harming the economy. So and Roger, how do you put your money to work? How do you put your voice to work at the moment to be able to see a better outcome from so the, the negative one I'm hearing? From? Those are two different questions. So on money, right now, I'm about 70% in T-bills because I'm terrified. Um, not to say the market can't go up, but merely that my risk tolerance is now much lower than it was because at the margin, each action taken by the government is being harm is harmful. And the responses, at least in my world, in the tech world, have been more or less, well, they've been pretty lame. I still own Apple. I still own Facebook. I still own Yelp. I own some stocks, but not very many. So I'm highly concentrated, and I'm mostly in T-bills. In terms of influence, I'm trying to help companies. I've been working with Facebook directly, just saying, guys, hang on just a sec. There is a way to do this better. 
And I think to their credit, there are people inside Facebook trying to do that. So knock wood, if people exercise, it'll, it'll work out. Some might be listening, Roger McNamee. We've been listening. It's been wonderful to have your viewpoint throughout this hour. Of course, Roger McNamee, he's founder of Elevation Partners and Silver Lake Partners and still putting his money and voice to work. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology.